Hello everyone, welcome to another lovely interview at Room for Discussion. Today, we have the honor of sitting beside someone who not only carries a royal title, but also plays a vital role in driving the future of innovation and technology in the Netherlands. As special envoy for TechLeap, Prince Constantine is at the forefront of all of the future developments, as well as the economic growth and social change within this lovely country. But beyond just the boardrooms and the lovely tech conventions, who is the man behind the title? In this interview, we're going to be exploring the state of Dutch technology right now and Prince Constantine's role in it. We're going to see how he got from working at the European Commission to becoming special envoy at TechLeap. We're going to look in, be looking at various challenges that the Dutch technological sector faces today and what are the possibilities for growth. Importantly, we're going to discuss how this growth can benefit everyone and not just a select few. This interview will discuss all of these topics within the next hour. Stay tuned. And for now, please give a warm welcome to Prince Constantine. Welcome. It's really great to have the opportunity to interview you here today. And I'm sure that many of us are here mainly because we know you because of your title. We're sure that you are much more than that. You are working in tech, you're a family man. Could you please say yourself, how do you see your identity and how these different positions mix together? Uh, wow, my identity. That's a, <laughs> that's a great opening question. Um, well, um, I'm... I'm uh, basically driven uh, to support the Netherlands and, and, and Europe in any way I can. And uh, I'm looking, I look for a space where I think I can uh, add value. And I have uh, been working in kind of digitization and digital policy for over 20 years now. And uh, yeah, it felt very, very natural. And it's, it's, it's also one of the best, best jobs there is. You're working with only with uh, people that have uh, a very positive, uh, hey, <laughs> a very uh, kind of a very positive mindset, um, even you know against all odds, trying to to uh, make change uh, where that's for most people is impossible, um, and then to grow that into business, you have new op create new opportunities. Um, it's just a it's just a really really interesting space to be in. And when you were a student at university, you studied law yourself. Yeah. But would you say your personal ambitions kind of aligned with the work you do currently within the tech sector, or was it a result of a particular turning point? No, I, well, no, no. I was, so I, when I was in, in university, I was always quite sure that I was going to do something in Europe. Um, and uh, what I didn't know exactly, I was also quite convinced I would not become a lawyer uh, or do something with law, but I thought law was an interesting subject to help me kind of structure, structure problems and the whole kind of logical reasoning in, in law I found interesting. Um, but I never thought I would actually end up in tech, no, no. Was there perhaps a specific moment that brought that on then? Um, so after I, I did five years, my first years in my career were um, in uh, the European Commission, and I was in foreign policy mostly. And uh, there was some, I was actually responsible for telecoms. So we in, I was in the European Commission cabinet, you basically, follow the, the topics of the commissioner. So I was with Mr. Hans van der Broek. He was responsible for foreign policy and the enlargement of the EU. And um, so I had a number of countries that I was following. And then, uh, and then you also follow all the other subjects of, um, of the other commissioners. So you'd have internal market or transport. And, and so I had internal market and also had telecom. So I was in both. That's kind of my first kind of little steps into tech. And then I went to business school after that, and then I joined um, a management consultancy, and then after that I joined Rand Corporation, which is a kind of a policy think tank, and then I kind of gradually got, through, through some, some coincidence, I got into tech and, uh, and stayed there. Yeah, it's a really interesting path, and you've then worked closely with the European Commission with policy, and also in uh, the Rand Corporation, you worked very closely with policy and evaluations and that. How do you think that both your law education and this policy-minded work uh, impact the way that you work today? Um, well, I, I think the, the biggest impact is that I've kind of worked in public and private sectors. So, um, and I think there's, these are sectors that often don't communicate very well. Uh, and it's, but it's really important. I mean, you have 
universities are also kind of in between, mostly public in Europe, uh, and um, um, but you know are spinning out companies, so then you go into the private sector. There's all these, and and so um, bridging between the two has been quite a, um, a feature in my career. So also with the Rand Corporation, we're consulting private company, but a non-for-profit consulting for government usually. Um, and when I was at the European Commission, we worked mostly with you know with with tech companies and uh, etc. So it's always been that kind of bridge. So I think that's how it came. How the, these two came into my career. Well, you on the policy side, you previously discussed that the Dutch technology uh, sector could always be in a better state of innovation. Uh, were there any specific visible uh, signs that you saw of that? I mean, I'm, I'm, that's my job, right? I mean, if, if everything would be fine, then I would have no job. So, um, so it's my job to identify where we're not doing well and to uh, and to try to improve that. Yeah. Um, so there were quite a number of things that were not going that well, but of course there are a lot of things that do go well. What didn't, what wasn't going very well uh, with applying to universities was basically we were leading in 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 research, we were doing really well in education, but we're not doing very well in uh, in tech transfer. Compared to, for instance, uh, you know, Cambridge or ETH in in Zurich or Leuven in Belgium, so that was a, that's a challenge. And we were not doing very well in the amount of capital that was raised. We were not doing very well in scaling companies. So a lot of companies um, we were very enthusiastically starting companies, but we not growing them. So there were a number of these of these issues, and then there are a number of policy issues that we uh, identified early on and still haven't really managed to. Uh, to, to get the government to buy into, in terms of uh, taxes, in terms of um, uh, so taxes mostly to support um, venture capital, uh, and there's some some other things that we kind of identified. Actually, on the on the positive side, a lot was achieved on uh, actually on migration. So you had startup visa, um, and and um, also enlarging the whole kennismigrantenregeling. I don't know, if you, I don't know what the, what the the translation is that, but but really to ensure that that foreign talent could you know keep coming to the Netherlands. So that's actually something that we've been really quite successful in, and we're now trying to uh, not break down and just keep it keep it in the space. So now that we've got a better idea of your background and what you've done so far, I think it's a good time to zoom in more on what the reason you're here, which is of course Tech Leap. Uh, within the technology sector, the idea of an elevator pitch has become quite popularized as a way of selling your idea, right? And Given that some of the people in the audience today might not have heard of TechLeap, what would your elevator pitch be for it? <laughs> okay, I haven't practiced this one for a long time. <laughs> uh, um, but but uh, uh, no, um, the, the Netherlands, Netherlands has, has all the potential of becoming um, Europe's leading tech uh, tech country. We have the universities, we have um, we have we have the talent, we have a very entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, people generally. Uh, like entrepreneurship, uh, and so we basically have all the building blocks in, in place, and um, uh, but we don't always connect them well. So that's the role of Tech Leap to connect all the dots, uh, make sure that together we are stronger, and we're working very much with the founders to um, to scale their companies. So we've seen that um, startups in the Netherlands sometimes lack the ambition, lack the capital, lack uh, also lack some of the inputs that you might have if you. Um, grow your company in a place like Silicon Valley. So we're trying to bring some of those um, elements into the Netherlands so that companies here will scale faster and we'll see more innovation coming to the market. So would you say that TechLeap focuses more on being a hub for founders and execs or more as an intermediary between startups and funding or something completely different? Well, um, the basic objective is that the Netherlands should become a much more successful tech company of country. Uh, and that boils down into we have more successful tech companies. So you start looking at why, you know, how do you get companies to become more successful? So they need money, they need talent, uh, they need ambition, they need uh, not to be pestered too much by uh, over-regulation and those kind of things. So then you start looking at, okay, how can we, how can we basically use the, le the levers that we have to, uh, to improve those indicators? And then you have to ask yourself, are we the, is TechLeap the, the you know, the agent to do that. And sometimes we say, no, it's really the government, so we lobby the government or we tell the government, you know, these are things you can do with the tax levers or with regulatory levers. Um, we talk to pension funds and to try to make it easier for them to invest in venture capital. That's a way to get more capital to come here. So we really look at all those kind of barriers and try to see where we can 
make a difference. And uh, over time, we saw that um, so system change is something we need to do, and and uh, you know gathering data about the system, and you know that we know better who is investing in what, uh, what's holding us back, all those kind of things. But the shortcut to success is basically creating more successful companies. So we said if we now we're all proud that we have an Adyen in Amsterdam, you know, or Booking.com, or these kind of tech companies. Yeah. Um, but if we just have twice as many of them, we probably we have already achieved our objective. Yeah. So instead of trying to create an environment that is um, ideal for startups to grow, um, you also can just go straight to the companies and make sure that they get more capital, that they get better access to, 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 to knowledge, better access to talent, better access to international markets. And that's basically what we did. So we set up programs to identify those founders that we think have the potential of going uh, really going far, and we are supporting them on their way. So what are the different elements that you can use for supporting them? I understand that there is a lot of research that you do into quantifying the elements of the Dutch technological sector and then connecting people. But since you're a government-funded uh, organization, then how is it really that you put that money to use uh, and providing new ways for these companies to become more successful? Yeah, we're, we're government-funded, but we're an independent organization. So, uh, and actually, we, have, uh, we are now working towards getting less government funding, or the government is getting is working to getting like, giving us less funding, yeah, and, we're, they were and we're working to get more <laughs> private funding. That's right. So we're, we're basically privatizing most of our activities. Um, so um, we've basically had all the freedom to do whatever we wanted within the, within the law, so we can't really support individual companies with um, a certain kind of monetary value. We can't, be, we can't invest, for instance. We can't provide them all kinds of services for free. Uh, that's what's not allowed if you're if you're funded by the government. But but for the rest, we can do basically everything. We can write reports. We can gather data. We can support companies through peer peer to peer learning, which we which is actually mostly what we do. We don't really have a curriculum. We have basically six building blocks, and we have experienced entrepreneurs um, coming in to talk with uh, with with cohorts of companies so that they get one on one advice on how to. Um, you know, how to basically um, go to market in a foreign country, how to uh, raise capital, um, and and then we drill down with uh, with them on on specific topics that are important to them. That can also be leadership change. You know, um, these many of these companies grow through phases. So you start a company, you're with two people, and then you're a company with 100 people or with 200, 300 people, and in all these phases, you might need dif different profiles. So there will be a moment where a founder starts looking around, right, am I the right person to lead this company? So, and there are always other other founders that have gone through the same thing. So we bring them together, so they share experiences, and we can help them make the right leadership decisions. So that's basically what we're doing. Um, and then we still do the system change stuff, um, which I mentioned before, and that's mostly around first, you know, gathering data, uh, so you know what you're talking about, and then basically uh, starting to kind of prove the point how you can actually accelerate. Uh, on the different indicators, like more capital, more talent, and uh, and better market access. All right. The knowledge hub element of it seems to be very beneficial for companies. What kind of startups find their way to TechLeap? Is it uh, also affected by the way that you have uh, also an entry barrier for uh, startups to come to TechLeap and enter the network? FOMO. No. <laughs> uh, so, um, well, we, we no, we, we our sweet spot is scaling companies, so it's not the really early startups. They might come to us, and we try to help everyone to a certain degree, but we're not there for the really early stage companies. There are many, there's money, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure for that. You have accelerators and incubators, and again, the university also has many, many different opportunities that you, where you can start a company. We look really at those companies that already have 20, 30, 40 people. They maybe raised a few million, uh, and they're now really looking looking to scale and to set them up for that scaling phase where they then maybe raise um, higher amounts of money. So that's one. We have criteria. Um, and we look for them, and they look for us. So we try to create a cohort of the best tech companies in the Netherlands. Um, they could be run by any you know, national, uh, they but you have to be based here, or it should be a Dutch person somewhere you know, re you know, growing their company abroad. And, uh, and th those are kind of typical scale-ups. Um, then we have in what we call deep tech. So these are uh, more uh, you know, companies led by intellectual property, so more, you know, probably more the ones that you see coming out of universities. Uh, those we actually uh, support at an earlier stage. 
because we found that uh, once they get to scaling, uh, they've made most of the critical mistakes that kind of block them from scaling. This is in, in terms of how they, um, what the kind of investors they have, the kind of, um, you know, how they, how they uh, basically form their team. There are all kinds of decisions that you make early on that can actually have a very detrimental impact on uh, your ability to grow. So there we are looking at earlier stage companies. Uh, and we even have a, uh, um, we call it the academic startup competition, which is for um, for startups that come out of universities. All the universities can uh, um, can list, you can still do that actually. So if you have a really high potential um, startup from the University of Amsterdam, uh, you can uh, present them to the academic startup competition. And we, we then have a program where we take 60 uh, companies and we basically funnel them to 40, 20, 10. Um, and every round you get a lot of uh, service from us, but you do, there is a competition. So if you, you set certain goals, we kind of look if you actually are achieving your goals and then you go, you pass on to the next round and then the final 10, you get a trip to Silicon Valley. So it's, that's the lovely prize. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, moving, focusing more on your role, you are of course special envoy for tech. Very Leap. special. Very special yeah. envoy for tech. <laughs> Leap. What, we were curious to know what your day to day looks like practically. Oh, um, well, varies. I mean, I'm quite, um, I'm quite operationally involved with TechLeap. So uh, we have internal meetings, we have strategy meetings, we have, uh, I have uh, bilaterals, we have the leadership team. Um, I go to events like this to basically tell the story about, uh, about Dutch tech. Not so much about kind of marketing the Netherlands, but it's more about uh, trying to talk about why tech and why innovation is important. And... Uh, um, and every time, if I do an event like this, I look at you know why, how is this impacting the mission of TechLeap? And um, so, so we're doing things like that. I'm actually sometimes going abroad. Same thing. Sometimes you know, last week we were in London with uh, ten companies, and we were introducing them to a number of investors, uh, to other uh, tech companies in uh, in the UK to help them uh, actually you know, expand into the UK. Uh, we also had a, uh, one of our partners, Deloitte, so we did sessions around you know, taxes and other things yeah. and how to raise capital in the UK. So we do those kind of things, and I, go, I sometimes go along. And so it's, uh, it's super diverse. Yeah. I sometimes make a visit to a company. Um, so my, my week is, uh, is filled with really cool stuff. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you earlier mentioned Silicon Valley, London as well, and other big tech hubs like Shenzhen all around the world. They all have this idea that you need to be a very strong risk taker to really push for your startups. And we were wondering what you thought of the traditional Dutch culture of just being comfortable with yourself and how that affects the culture of innovation. You know, you have sayings like do normal or being yourself is crazy enough. Does that really hinder the culture of innovation we have here? Um, well, I, I mean, culture is, is it's not, that's not the only part of our culture, right? I mean, you can also say uh, it's a trading country. And yeah. so I do think that, that that history of trading has an impact on how we build companies. We, we, like, we are basically dealers. Yeah. So we, we like to make money without making, taking a big risk because we actually invented insurance as well and, yeah. and we invented the stock exchange. These are things to basically you can share risk. Um, so I do think some of that is actually in our culture. So we... Um, we, we like to be independent, we like to um, be entrepreneurs, but we don't want to build big companies because it, it also it reduces our autonomy. The Dutch love to be uh, relatively autonomous and, uh, um, and uh, uh, independent. Yeah. And uh, once you grow, you have to start you know, introducing processes, you have to, maybe you attract foreign capital, then there is, uh, or uh, then you know, investors will have an opinion on, how you run your business. So you're basically reducing your independence again. So we saw actually that the Dutch entrepreneurs on average um, are less ambitious than, for instance, well, the, um, the Sc Scandinavian or others because uh, they don't, uh, the, and the metric is, um, are you foreseeing that your, that you, your company will have 20, um, 20 or more people in the next five years? And many more entrepreneurs in the Netherlands say, well, no, it's fine, you know, fine to stay under, the, under that level. So that's, that is definitely an issue. Um, I think, think risk-taking is always a bit, I mean, everybody just mentioned risk-taking, but risk is a, the risk is always a, there's a risk-reward factor. So it's not about taking stupid risk, you know, it's not like in the U.S. people take stupid risk. No, their risk is 
rewarded in another way, their risk is also funded in another way. So you have investors with a lot more money, so they can take risk at the early stage when it's very risky. Uh, because you do small investments, you do a lot of them. Uh, and if you know that you, um, you know, in the next round you see, oh, those are the successful ones, you can actually double down on the ones. And then actually when they're largely de-risked, then a lot of money goes in. So, uh, and we say, oh, they're so risk-taking. No, they're not risk-taking. They just have, because they have much more money, they can take risks in a different mm -hmm. way. What I do think is that thinking big is something which, which also comes with, uh, you know, if you're in a big geography, you, uh, you, you think, you know, if you can serve 300 million people, and if that's what all your peers do, it's logical that you think, you know, I'm going to serve 300 million people. Yeah. In Europe or in a small country like the Netherlands, you know, people tend to say, well, I'm first serving the Netherlands, and, and then I might look to Belgium, and you know, these are kind of incremental st steps. And uh, there I think there is a challenge. You have to kind of get people to think, you know, to, from the start, you know, how am I building a business to be an international business, and, and how big do I think this can grow? Because if you don't think, if you don't dream big, you can never do big. You, know, you can't go faster or further than you can imagine. So uh, this is actually what we do. We're bringing successful founders to talk to our, um, to kind of these, these less experienced founders, um, also to just open their minds and say, what is actually possible? And if, you know, if your company in print in the US has already raised five times as much money yeah. and is already serving uh, uh, has like a 400% growth, where you were at 100% growth. In Holland, that sounds great, but uh, an investor in, in Silicon Valley wouldn't even look at you if you're in this stage and you're only growing at 100%. And just by knowing that, you think, oh, I, uh, maybe 400% is also an option. But if you're just surrounded with people that say 50 is already great and 100 is just amazing, then uh, you, you just, it's, it's very hard to then yeah. uh, think beyond that level. So is this kind of a cultural change in dreaming big something that you think should change in the Netherlands? And is it something that, yeah, is, uh, is changeable by just wanting to change? Well, in, 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 a commu in, a, in the tech community, these things uh, you know, can change. Um, but I think this comes from a very, very you know, young age where uh, a kid that has a big idea, people will say, you know, basically just, just do normal or don't, you know, uh, so I think it's also about how parents look at their kids and how uh, school teachers look at their kids, how peers look at their kids. It's very hard to, to change that. But I think you're already seeing also in, in the Netherlands, you see a lot of you know, new school concepts that also try to uh, stimulate kids to, to be more creative, to think more out of the box. Uh, and those things can actually help, I think, uh, because it's very hard to, um, to, you know, to um, compete with, with people in the U.S. that have always been put on a crate from the from the age this you know that they were you know this high and they were already you know, um, you know speaking up in public and have to kind of express their ideas and the ideas you know should always be like big and bold and all that if that's the way you're you're brought up and you have 20 years of people telling you you know just be normal and don't don't do crazy that's of course pretty hard to overcome. Well, uh, now that we've established kind of the Dutch state of tech, if we start to zoom out a bit and we look at the state of tech in our neighboring countries, where we have countries like France and Germany that are really leading in terms of the presence of unicorns. unicorns. Uh, for, for those of the audience that don't, don't know, unicorns, unicorns are just startups or private companies that are valued at more than a billion. billion. And in the Netherlands, we have nine. If you look at France, there's 27 and Germany, 31. Is there yeah, a no, reason? So one is we don't have nine, we have more, but, then, um, but that doesn't really matter. France didn't have any unicorns. It was their, their main pain point. So uh, Macron said, we want unicorns. So and a unicorn, it's a really stupid metric uh, because uh, basically um, if I overpay in an investment, yeah. you know, I give you, I, if I give you um, for 10 million, uh, you know, I, I um, um, uh, basically only ask 1% of, yeah. of the equity, then bam, you're there, right? So it's, it's, it's basically if you, if you pump in a lot of public money into into companies yeah. at, uh, at at high valuations, then yeah, that's that's a way you can do it. So I think it's that's it's a bit unhealthy. Um, you should look at like what is the uh, and I think Sweden is a really good country uh, to to look at and and a country like Estonia that on or Israel you know on a relatively small base um, they have generated just an incredible amount of, of companies because the 
the, the founders are really ambitious and aggressive and they have a, a venture capital industry that really supports, yeah. uh, supports them to grow, especially actually you know, in a country like Israel who has no local market and, uh, and have, you know, the, what they have produced is, is really under the circumstances also really, really incredible. Uh, if you compare that to Berlin or Germany where you have, you have everything basically, um, uh, what they have been producing is relatively, it's, it's underwhelming. Um, and um, so if I may ask then, what leads to the difference? I think, well, well there's a lot of stereotypes there. It's, uh, but I think, uh, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, uh, I think in, in Germany in general, companies are uh, more um, kind of technology based and engineered. So uh, in the Netherlands, they'd be more commercial. Um, and so it's a bit more about market problem and a bit less about kind of just designing the the um, uh, the product um, in uh, and yeah I don't know it's um, because also these tech communities are not like the country it's, it can be quite dense like in in France what they did really well um, it's like a privately driven like uh, Xavier Niel the, the uh, you know is a tech entrepreneur he um, he started uh, Station F which is a really really incredible space a former station in in uh, in Paris where really all the tech community, but also big tech companies like Meta and Google, they're all kind of been there. They have, um, so you have thousands of companies together. Um, so there's exchanging and, and, you know, so in that little, in that little microcosmos, they have done amazing stuff and they're really stimulating each other to, to think big and to be, so if you go there, you know, they're all English speaking, they're very international, you know, they, everybody's talking about growing fast. You step outside, Station F, and you're back in France, right? And then things is everything is very French, and it gets very, it can be very bureaucratic. So um, it is actually these tech tech communities can be very productive bubbles, yeah. and uh, which you can actually create as well. Yeah, but um, you kind of mentioned it earlier with the access to funding and stuff. If you look at overall EU wide, it's significantly lower in terms of venture capital spend yeah. compared to the US. Yeah. But you mentioned examples like Scandinavia, Estonia, and Israel. Do you think for the Netherlands it's better to go through that direction of venture funding or to try to follow the American push as much money into the system? Well, America is not pushing it just as money. I mean, America has private funds, right? It's yeah, not public yeah. funds. So America has a quite a good system of feeding this, you know, through public money, through DARPA and other, other quite well-structured uh, research uh, support funds. And then... But it's the private market that is that is accelerating, and it means that they're much more agile. So if there's a new development, you know, the, the the market will follow. You see this now with AI, and and they actually absorb a lot of the risk. So they will maybe waste a lot of money on a on a on a new development, uh, and it will kind of then you know the hype cycle goes down, and and then actually there's a basis, and they start actually making money on these things, whereas public sector is likely to follow late. Yeah. And then putting too much money into things that are not kind of going that well anymore. So it's it's uh, you have to really be careful with that, with kind of pumping in money. Um, I, I think every country has to follow its own model. Um, um, you know, France has is a central um, as a centrally led government, and they can do this. They can say top down. You know, next five years, tech is going to be a priority, and we're going to just just we can make this work. Could never help happen in the Netherlands. It's just impossible. Yeah. Um, the UK did it. Uh, UK was also a laggard in terms of innovation in the 90s. Now they have the leading tech, they were the second t uh, tech ecosystem in the world after yeah. Silicon Valley in London. So it's really amazing what they have achieved. But that's possible in a, in a kind of a, in a government like, like theirs, which is centrally led and, um, and, and, and can be pretty focused. Whereas in a, con in a kind of consensus uh, culture like the Netherlands, where you have uh, coalition government, it's much more difficult to be kind of that single-minded, I think. And, and even if you compare to, to countries like, like Singapore or UAE, and now even Saudi Arabia, which has been uh, just made a total kind of uh, uh, change over the last, uh, last five years, 10 years to uh, embrace tech and, 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 and just basically pull in so much capital. Um, it, it, it's pretty amazing what is, what is possible if you, if you have that kind of dedication. So I, I'm, I'm more interested in countries that, um, that didn't have that, like Israel, um, where there's a very good collaboration between private sector, academia, and, um, and, and government, or 
a country like Estonia because it came out of communism and had, you know, uh, if you compare also with the neighboring countries, they've just done an, a really remarkable job. Um, um, Sweden is also interesting because they have a lot of private funding uh, where they are actually quite a, a bit of country like ours, a quite relatively socialistic, uh, equalitarian, but they have just a lot of private funding going into, into innovation. And, uh, and you see the results when they have uh, uh, quite remarkable successes. Last month, uh, Draghi laid out the path for Europe as a whole to be more competitive, and I think then kind of compensating for different mm -hmm. national governments, uh, they are a little bit lagging behind, um, and trying to boost that as a whole. How do you see that this further collaboration between the EU member states and the unification of the system factors into here and the role of TechLeap in advancing that? Oh, I don't know. TechLeap doesn't have a role in that, but we will support it, of course. I think it's a, it's a really good report. Uh, it's a very good, like the Monty report was a very good report, and like the Letta report is a good report, and we have had many of those reports. Um, the reality of, of European politics is slightly different. I mean, you have a commission that's always pushing forward, wants more open markets, wants more mobility across borders, you want more uh, free trade um, on, on the whole, um, and uh, also more circular economies, all that, you know, the kind of stuff we also want. Um, but member states have different agendas, and they have a different pace and different priorities, so they will start kind of pushing back against this. And the, the weakness of the report is that it actually um, uh, was commissioned by the European Commission. So it's basically the European Commission that is, has already, is already fighting with those member states. Uh, and they now have another, another argument, but it's still their argument. They procured it. It's not a report that comes from the member states themselves. So I think it's, it, we have to keep doing this because it, it, it basically writes up what the potential of Europe is. And we shouldn't forget that, that Europe has an incredible potential. I mean, it's still the continent where a lot of people actually come to because they want to live here because they want to live in freedom and because they have a freedom, you know, there's a freedom of speech, there's, uh, there's a social welfare systems uh, in place, um, and, and uh, that's really very valuable. Um, on the other hand, what he does point out is that if we want to stay, you know, um, have the same kind of uh, wealth, uh, and, we, and if we want more people to actually benefit from that, we have to also grow and have to invest in innovation, and we have to stay competitive in that sense, and there, um, and there, I think we uh, we acknowledged, I think all but already for a long time, that we uh, we're falling short, and it also needs investment, and and that investment has to come from somewhere, and we've we've kind of limited our our options there. Yeah, but if we look at more established uh, Dutch tech companies like ASML yeah. and Adyen, how would you say they compare to their foreign counterparts in terms of innovation or real potential for growth? So you can't compare those two companies. <laughs> Um, Adyen is a, is a software company and uh, they're solving some really technical and really boring problems yeah. but it's really scalable yeah. and, uh, and, and ASML, I mean I, I, I invite you all to, uh, to go to YouTube and, and look at a clip about how, um, how um, um, a chips factory or fab yeah. is actually yeah. uh, functioning it's, and ASML is just one machine out of maybe hundreds of machines that are in one factory, and the one factory operates like a, like a machine. So it's really hard to innovate in that system because it's an already completely optimized system. To build a factory like that probably costs you, I don't know, 10, mil 10 billion. And uh, so if I then, if, you know, there's a building design and all that, and I come, hey, I've got an innovation, we'll make all of this much better. You, you still can't get that innovation yeah. into that machine. So, um, so what they've, what ASML has built is uh, is some some of the most remarkable technology, uh, but there are so many other steps in that process that are close to as remarkable. It's just that they are the first step, which makes them uh, which makes them the crucial one. So they've created a position in um, in in a global value chain that is that is really unique. So of course now we see ASML and said, oh, we want more of that. We want more like uh, we want to be cr you know in critical value chains and we want to have that that specific company so that we can control everything. Um, and that's really hard to achieve. And I think what, it, what Adyen has, has proven is that uh, basically out of, out of relatively nothing, I mean, they had a company before, so they were good in payments, uh, that they could just build without, you know, really using the Dutch st startup ecosystem or anything, just by having an international mindset, by being super dedicated to uh, their purpose and, and really rigorous in their execution. 
that in relatively short time they could actually build such a company. And, uh, and we've seen other companies now doing that, like a company like Remote, is, uh, the word says it, they're remote, they're, you know, the founder is based here, but the company is, is actually now a Delaware, um, a Delaware company, but, and, and people are working everywhere because they work remote, they're facilitating remote working. But they grew their company in three years mm -hmm. from zero to uh, three billion in three years. And it, it's, so that is also possible here if you have that kind of dedication and that very rigorous execution. And I sometimes compare it with, um, with um, Olympians, you know, people that are uh, really dedicated about how they, how they go about and how they work towards their success with that is an Olympic medal. But, uh, you know, you get um, the right uh, dietary requirements, you get the team set up around you, you to, and, and everything just to get to that goal. And that's what I think what, what the Agen founders have, have achieved and what Remote has achieved is basically by being very rigorous, uh, taking some risk, of course, along the line, but and showing that it is actually possible. And for us and for our founders, it's super inspiring that you have those people here, that you have people just like you and I that have been able to build something that is so, that is so impactful. Yeah. Yeah. Another topic that we wanted to touch on to conclude the discussion on the Dutch technological sector is the role of international talent here. Um, according to your TechLeap's own report as well, there is a problem with people wanting to work in tech. It is like a little bit decreasing. And what do you think is the general role of human capital and international talent in the startup sector currently? So you, human capital is, is absolutely critical. So it starts with in most tech ecosystems first have a, have a problem with just entrepreneurship. And then immediately comes money. Money is, uh, everybody will say there's too little capital. And then at a certain point, capital will flow. And, also, and then when these companies start growing and many companies start scaling, then they all need people. And then talent becomes a really huge thing. And, um, and it's any, everywhere you look in the world where there's a tech ecosystem, maybe, maybe I don't know, China might be a bit different, but uh, it will be, uh, it will consist of, of, of foreigners. So uh, large percentage of foreigners. I mean, if you just look at the US, uh, Google, foreign, Microsoft, foreigners, you know, I mean, all of them are led by, by migrants or have a migrant background. Elon Musk is from South Africa. So you have to have a, 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 a very inviting, open space where all that talent wants to go that has the ambition to, to yeah, do your PhDs and then run, go into starting businesses and all that. So that is super important. And considering um, the current situation that we're facing here, I'm just going to say it honestly as it is, we're not doing very well at it. We're limiting the opportunities for international students to stay here, restricting migration. What will be the impact uh, of this on Dutch startups? Um, yeah, well, I think it will be, it can potentially be big because um, uh, if, if I look at the, um, the startups that, that emerge out of university, that basically are building IP, you know, on IP of universities, uh, those, I wouldn't say by majority, but definitely by probably half of them are led by foreigners. So and I, have, I, have, I have, this is not tested, but I think that foreigners that do a PhD here might be more inclined to actually do a business than someone, a Dutch person, because they're more inclined to do science, because that's a career choice. And I don't know, but I just see that there are um, more, uh, definitely percentage-wise, many more foreigners in, in these kind of companies. So it's, it's about you know, starting the companies, uh, it's the, just the, the staff that you need. Um, it's super important that we keep, uh, keep that kind of that open environment. Also, I think now the government, and this is, is this kind of Chatham House rules or not? Uh, oh. probably, probably not. I, uh, <laughs> um, no, I, I, <laughs> I think what is, um, you, you cannot be too opportunistic about this. Just saying, you know, okay, we, those are the subjects we need. You know, we need engineers, we need, um, you know, technical people. And so those we, we allow in and we don't allow the others in. That is not a very welcoming environment. So it's all about, you know, creating a welcoming, welcoming environment which have, where you have all the disciplines that actually are here and where there's a good mix of, of foreign students and, and domestic students and, uh, and that that culture uh, um, exists. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's definitely it's super important. So. Yeah. And Keep at this uh, point, I think it is a good time to turn to audience questions, uh, to hear from the local students here. Uh, who has any questions? Yeah, over there. Uh, you will have to see the microphone. 
Thank Thanks you so much. Uh, yeah, sorry, <laughs> this was too loud. I heard uh, you also mentioned that you're interested to talk to pension funds to invest in venture capital. And I wondered, how is investing in venture capital firms less risky than investing in startups? Is it because you invest into startups through a middleman and a person? Is that safer? Because in the sense that pension funds already lost so much in 2008 when they invested in risky ventures, and now you're suggesting that pension funds might again invest in a risky venture. That's why I was kind of worried because already a lot of Dutch people already, uh, the social welfare is kind of get eroded because pension funds cannot pay out the pensions because they invest into risky ventures. How would you handle that? And, and no, they, it's not that they don't pay out pensions because they risk, they invest in risky ventures. Maybe they do bad investments or, and, and, and I think the, the most risky um, ventures were, uh, you know, banks and they were considered uh, triple A, and then before they were suddenly um, junk. So um, the things that happened in 2008, uh, you really can't, um, you can't relate to venture capital or, or startups, et cetera. So um, what, ven what venture capital has shown, like private equity, that it is a, a, an asset class that can return superior um, um, profits to investors, um, and especially if you can spread the risk between funds. So I wouldn't advise a pension fund, except for when they really start, when they, if they would build the capabilities to actually start investing in individual startup companies. But you need to invest in whole populations of startup companies. And that's what venture capital is supposed to do. They're already kind of spreading your risk. And then the pension funds can fund the venture capital funds to do that. And if they, they should not do that with one venture capital fund, but they should do it with a number of them. And over time, you can just see their performance. So you can actually really manage your risk very well. And, and in the bigger scheme of things, you have a portfolio, we have high risk uh, investments, you have very low risk investments and, and high return and low return. So usually you'll take a, a little slice of your investment will be higher risk, but high return. And then and for a pension fund like APG, which has, or um, ABP, which has 400 uh, billion under management to put 1 billion in venture capital would not be, when they don't even they don't even realize that you know even if they would lose the billion they wouldn't even know um, but they won't so the points we make is it's a good investment and we and venture capital has shown has matured has shown that it's actually good so it's also good for your pensioners two it's the it's the way the most direct way that you can actually invest in innovation in your uh, in your country um, so actually it's money that goes into all the things that we want like the energy transition and those things. Um, and um, uh, and three, um, it's it's always going to be quite a small part of uh, of a total investment portfolio, and therefore it's already um, already kind of un less risky. Um, so I think pensioners will also benefit from it. Yeah. Like if your point is that pension funds should not gamble with um, with pensioners' money, I fully agree with that. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have another question over there. I think that was the first time I saw. We can do one more. Hello, thank you for your talk. I had a question about what you think about the geopolitical position of the Netherlands, for example, our relationship with the United States and the current political climate, because you also said that it's very important to get foreign talents here, but at the same time, the government, the government policies, it's not as feasible as we would like to. So for example, you know, the VVD is the only party that openly supports work uh, migration and at the universities we're also letting in less international students. So how will this, this will obviously affect the technology landscape of the Netherlands. How will this on a bigger level affect the geopolitical position of the, United, uh, of the Netherlands? Um, there are a number of questions there. Um, I think the Netherlands is a small country, uh, but a powerful country in Europe. So I think Europe is still the main kind of our main power base, and we should work on uh, on working very closely with Europe to be to stay relevant. Um, the U.S. is an ally and is an important ally for us, um, and uh, and I hope that also under the next presidency that uh, that will still uh, be be the case. And I think we're better off uh, with, uh, as as strong allies. Um, of course, there are things changing in the world, and the, the powers are definite power shift uh, to the east, which uh, which can be, you know, and has been over the last uh, 20 years a very positive one, also for the global economy. Uh, but there is a, clearly a rebalancing there, 
about you know strategic alliances and uh, and how we we deal with those risks. And uh, as people say, we shouldn't be naive. We should actually be also kind of protecting our intellectual property, those kind of things. Uh, but I I personally think that we uh, we still you know we would still be better off to be mutually dependent on each other so that we can. Uh, grow together instead of we try to outcompete each other because that always ends into uh, someone winning over the other and that typically is not something that's very sustainable. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for now we're going to move on with a couple of last questions of this interview. Questions yeah. in the room or questions from you? Questions from me. <laughs> You're overruling the room. Yes. Someone is very eager there who's really kind of... Okay, will you keep yeah. it brief? Okay. Okay, okay. If we have time left over, we're going to go back to audience questions. Okay, okay. Um, and let's hope that we have time for that. I would like to talk a little bit still about diversity and accessibility in the world of tech. It's, there's a huge entry barrier. There's a lot of capital needed in order to take off time and think about an idea that you would like to do and to start from zero. Venture capital and the people deciding in venture capital is one of the most male-dominated and white fields overall. How do you ensure that Tech Leaps works to benefit all startups, not just those that are started by the most privileged parts of our society? Whoa, that's a lot of uh, assumptions there. Um, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, um, so um, it's, it's definitely true that in the tech world, people with um, higher education have better chances. Uh, but it's also true that we have unicorns coming out of everywhere in the world where we didn't have, see that at all. You know, Nigeria is a very strong com uh, country for for um, for tech. Um, South Africa, uh, um, Kenya, where it wasn't before. Now we're seeing uh, countries coming uh, coming forward that were uh, were relatively overlooked in the past because they have uh, they have a very strong tech sector. So um, I wouldn't say that tech is only supporting those that already are um, uh, successful. And actually, as I said, we said before, in Silicon Valley has given um, tech talent from all over the world an opportunity to build uh, to build big companies. What are the ways that uh, you can ensure for that to happen? Sorry. What are the ways that we can ensure for that to happen? Well, I think so. There's another thing around which you mentioned about uh, gender equality and access that uh, that people, certain you know, so minorities might have to to actually enter this sector. So we, we did observe that venture capital was very white, male-dominated, uh, and so we tried to uh, address that. We, we started an initiative called Fundright, where we, we talked to the sector and we set quota, with voluntary quotas. And if you look what in the last five years has happened, there's so many more women now um, in uh, investment funds. Um, but it was, there, wasn't, there wasn't a career path to becoming an investor. Most in the, in the Netherlands, it would come out of a bank. You know, so you have, first of all, to look like how many women are there in in banks you know, that might actually make it to venture capital. And so we also worked you know, to, to get more kind of, get a, get a curriculum for, for VC. And, we, and that's now happening, especially in the UK, they've done that. And, and these people are actually coming over. So a, a, a lot has changed already. Um, and, and then it depends very much on the sector you're in. So if you are in, in fashion tech, you, you see more women. If you're in, in tourism tech and those kind of things, in, more, in biotech, you see more women. Um, and and also more foreigners. Where if you are a SaaS company or a fintech, uh, it's likely to be more um, more male uh, male oriented. And if you are in deep tech robotics, uh, then it gets even more um, more masculine and white and middle aged. So there's also an age thing. Uh, so it's it's true that you know there's there are different demographies for different kind of sectors. But there are also different issues why, uh, why that is the case. Um, so in, in these deep tech companies, you have to look at you know, engineering, uh, you know, the whole education system, how that uh, already kind of uh, filters out uh, certain, certain demographies, you know, women, you know, why they wouldn't join, uh, would go to Delft, for instance, to study or do a technical study here. Um, that's, um, that's a kind of deep societal issue, which we, we can't solve. Um, but we, uh, what we do try to do is uh, at the at the the, the kind of front end, you know, always ensure that um, that women entrepreneurs get a podium. Uh, we try to to you know to get them into our programs. Even sometimes with the criteria don't completely fit, but we think 
is good for the program because diversity is basically good. It, it, it gives it completely different dynamics. And, um, and you have to break through this situation. Uh, and there's another thing is that um, sometimes, um, you know, some categories of entrepreneurs also limit themselves. So we found that um, there's also a cultural thing between female and male entrepreneurs where male are maybe more likely to bluff, more likely to sell is themselves that, uh, bigger. Is that something that we should allow? Or well, allow that to do, <laughs> yeah, of course you allow them to bluff, but you should, female entrepreneurs should also bluff a bit more and should not be that <laughs> uh, modest about their capabilities. Or, uh, and so, but that has very much to do with um, peers. If you see people, uh, you know, reach, reach out to female entrepreneurs, you know, um, and discuss these things. We found that, um, that um, um, venture capital, for instance, would basically um, ask different questions to female entrepreneurs than to male entrepreneurs. Because the men were asked about their, their dreams and you know, where they were going to. The women were asked, where are you coming from? And how do you, you, know, how do you manage your work-life balance? Yeah. So it's, but it's making those things uh, clear. Also making, making female entrepreneurs aware that, you know, that this is an issue. So you can actually overcome that. Yeah. So it's and, and and we should all help each other. I think it's um, we you know you, this is not a big kind of structural thing that you can solve by with big structural solutions. It's about sitting here together. It's it's about picking up uh, really talented women that are working and basically saying, well, you can actually go twice as fast. How do, how would you want to do that? Um, and I think that's 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 something of a community that you need to create, and uh, and it also takes time. Uh, on that note, as we get towards the end of our interview, you, of course, in your position have seen so many different inspiring stories uh, with startups. If you weren't in the position you were now, and if you're given the chance to run your own startup, where would you put that in, or who would you work with? Who would you surround yourself with? Uh, well, I would want to work with people that have um, a very kind of strong can-do mentality. Um, and um, it's it's really important to get people to surround yourself with people that are um, are really good at what they're doing, that they can uh, operate autonomously. Um, they have to be uh, curious, uh, slightly stubborn, because you have to kind of stand your ground, but also curious and, and open for feedback. I think definitely not defensive people, uh, definitely not uh, entitled people, um, but some people have to also have a bit of a chip on their shoulder. That kind of they have this kind of drive to want to do something bigger, better. Um, that are not too comfortable. Um, you have to have a group that actually stimulates each other to go faster and you know get you out of your comfort zone. So that I would be looking for. And what kind of product would this extremely the product group be working on? Uh, pff, um, the product. Uh, what's what's your elevator pitch now? <laughs> well, I've, I'm not on it. <laughs> um, uh, what product would you? Um, I said, well, my product is a tech leap. Um, my product is is what I'm building now, uh, and I want to build uh, you know the strongest tech ecosystem in 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 Europe. Um, that's my drive. That's what I do well. I don't do fintech. I don't do biotech. I don't do these kind of things. Yeah. So I I you know I don't. That's that's my product. It's a very thank good you. product to have, yeah. exactly. And on that lovely note, we want to say thank you for your time. And thank you to the audience as well for spending your time with us in this lovely conversation. And just before we finish off, I want to say let's have one lovely round for the Prince. <laughs> this lovely interview, interesting. Please be sure to come by again next week, Thursday at 1 o'clock, where we have a conversation with economist and TikTok influencer Gary Stevenson on a lovely conversation about working within the investment industry and, of course, fighting for inequality. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day.